And Claire, yes, I'm just confirming that, yes, we'll turn it off for when you're performing so that you don't stare back at yourself. Okay. So folks, we've just opened up the webinar. Thanks so much for being here. I'll just give us a second here, last minute adjustments being made in the space. Okay, I think we're good to roll. Looks good on my end. So good afternoon, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue on behalf of Concordia University's Force Space. Located on unceded indigenous lands in Jojaga, Montreal, Force Space is activated daily via live events such as this one to create engagement around the various research projects and initiatives and dialogues and development happening across the university. So to that end, it's our pleasure to collaborate once again with the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Society and Culture to welcome all of you into our virtual and our physical space for this roundtable on picture recitation and medical storytelling with Claire Dolan, M.K. Cherviets, and Priyanka Jain. We're so excited to have you all here joining us, either in person or via Zoom. So I'll just mention that we are live streaming this event, uh, and I'll put that link into the chat momentarily. And to tell you more about today's uh, happening, I'll pass it over to Director of CISC, Mark Sussman. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be back in the fourth space. Um, it's a sunny and bright snowy day in Montreal. Um, so thank you for joining um, in uh, here, a, a cold and chilly, but very, uh, very, very bright, nice day today. Um, so um, yes, uh, thanks, Anna. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists and performers for today. Uh, but first, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia is located on unceded indigenous land. The Ganyagahaga Nation is recognized as the custodian of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Chojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations, and today it's home for a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Um, I'll introduce uh, our, our panelists today one at a time, um, but uh, I'll just say a word about our theme at CISC for this winter term. We've been thinking a lot about uh, ideas relating to community health and what it means to uh, perform, write, narrate, tell stories that um, both uh, treat health as a topic, but also uh, in a sense, perform healing. Um, and we want to kind of go deeper into that and think more of that. How, how, do, how does narrative heal us? How can it help us um, to connect better with other people, to connect with ourselves and our own bodies, to uh, heal socially as well as biologically and physically? Um, so that's, that's, that's just a small theme, but um, uh, it's something we're thinking about over the course of many events this winter term. Um, so today's um, uh, 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 narrative forum that we're going to think about is called Picture Recitation. Um, and for two of our artists, it's a performance forum. And for one, it relates to the uh, grand tradition of graphic novel, uh, graphic um, uh, storytelling, and uh, comics. Um, but we'll start with uh, Claire Dolan, who is a painter, director, and performer, and an intensive care nurse living in northeastern Vermont. As a puppeteer with the Breton Puppet Theater for decades, she performed in cities and towns throughout the United States and internationally. In 2010, Claire created the Museum of Everyday Life, an ongoing multifaceted museum experiment whose goal is a slow motion cataloging of life via objects of no monetary value, yet immense consequence. She's a specialist in picture story performance, 
which we also call Kenta Storia by its Italian name very often. And she's the co-founder of Banners and Cranks, the first internationally, Amer uh, sorry, the first international American festival devoted to this performance form, which occurs annually in rotating venues. Um, I'll just say for myself, I've learned uh, about this performance form from watching Claire perform over many decades. And I'm very excited that she has come to do her latest show at Concordia, which is called Exquisite Corpse. So I will give the floor to Claire. Okay. Hello. Thank you for coming today. As Mark said, I work as an intensive care unit nurse in a small hospital in remote rural Vermont. And so every day I touch and I manipulate human bodies every day that I'm at work. Um, so this gives, me, this gives me a very particular perspective on the world. <laughs> Where I work as a nurse 
and she's brought into room 222. The ancient Greeks also had an understanding of the body in constant motion, but they pictured it a lot differently from this. Empedocles, for example! Empedocles believed that the entire universe was governed by two essential life forces, the life force of love and the life force of strife. Now, according to Empedocles, at one time, all of our body parts floated freely about. Noses and eyeballs and feet and penises and hands, all floating around in a kind of primordial soup until the life force of love joined those parts together in the correct order and the life force of strife separated out those things that did not belong and the life force of love took those leftover bits and put them together into other things like elephants and mountains and unsavory hitchhiker. It's not her fault. Now, you might believe that the opposite of the body in constant motion is the body frozen in complete stillness. The patient in room 221, the room opposite Billy Joe's, that patient is Bobby Ray. Bobby Ray has advanced Parkinson's disease, which means that his nerves can no longer move his muscles. So bit by bit, he is becoming completely motionless. Until finally, only muscle movement left to him is his breathing, and even that isn't going so well. But Bobby Ray has enrolled in a study at MIT, a study trying to learn more about Parkinson's disease, and it's very important to him. And so he and his family have, have agreed that he wants to be kept alive as long as possible so that the study continues in the hopes that they'll learn more about Parkinson's for people who have the disease in the future. His arms and legs are motionless. His face is frozen. Only his eyes can still open and close. But beneath this utter stillness, the elaborate activity of dying is taking place. However, our orders are to keep him alive as long as possible. And so, we insert things into Bobby Ray's body, a breathing tube hooked to a ventilator, a feeding tube into his stomach, a tube draining the urine from his bladder, a tube into his right radial artery to measure his arterial blood pressure, and we clean his mouth and turn him and reposition him every two hours to prevent ventilator-acquired pneumonia and pressure ulcers. Every time we reposition him, he squeezes his eyes shut tighter. I'm sorry, 
I say to him, it's time for us to turn you now. I'm sorry, I say. He squeezes his eyes shut tighter. Meanwhile,
just what she meant. The way that to be moving all the time feels just like standing still. And to be standing still feels like a hurricane. Thank you, Thank you, Claire, Claire Dolan, Dolan from Glover, Vermont. Um, we'll uh, have a moment to, to speak with um, all of our three panelists and performers and artists at the end. Um, I just wanted to remind those of you tuning in uh, over Zoom that um, we're, you're invited to uh, send comments and questions. Um, and we can see them and we'll relay them at the end. So please uh, send in your, your comments over the chat. Um, um, thanks. Um, our next uh, presenter is going to uh, speak in a slightly different mode. Um, I'm very excited also to welcome M.K. Serwick, uh, R.N. M.A., um, a nurse, cartoonist, educator and co-founder of the field of graphic medicine. Um, she's the creator of Taking Turns, stories from the HIV AIDS Care Unit 371 from Penn State University Press. And she's a co-author of the Graphic Medicine Manifesto um, and editor of the two-time Eisner Award winning Menopause, a Comic Treatment, all from Penn State Press. Um, MK is also the comics editor for the journal Literature and Medicine, and she co-manages the website, podcast, annual conferences, and online community of graphic medicine. Um, MK regularly teaches graphic medicine at Northwestern Medical School, um, the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, the University of Illinois Medical School, and the University of Chicago. She's an artist in residence at Northwestern Center for Medical Humanities and Bioethics, and has served as a senior fellow of the George Washington School of Nursing Center for Health Policy and Media Engagement. I hope it's okay. I'm reading all of your, um, all of your uh, affiliations. Um, um, she's also a Will Eisner Fellow in Applied Cartooning, Cartooning at the Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont. So there's a Vermont connection uh, already going um, uh, this afternoon. Um, so uh, MK, thank you so much for joining us from Chicago, and I'll turn it over to you um, to talk to us about your work. Thanks. Uh, I think you're still muted, so sorry. You think by this point I would have figured that out. <laughs> uh, what I'm saying is that I'm really honored to be on this panel. It, it's just wonderful. What an amazing performance. I really just want to talk about that, but uh, we'll have a chance to do that at the end. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and hopefully that will come through. Is that working? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Priyanka. I, I can see you nodding. Thank you. Um, terrific. So, um, hi. <laughs> yeah. As as my introduction said, I'm a nurse and I'm a cartoonist. Um, uh, I have this little elevator pitch that I do to explain the odd work that I do. Uh, is that I'm a nurse who uses comics to contemplate the complexities of illness and caregiving. And by contemplate there, sorry, by uses there, what I really mean to say is I both make comics, I teach comics, um, and of course I read them. So um, there's different use, uh, ways I mean that. Um, so I wanna reiterate that if you have any comments or questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I think one of the few benefits of, well, there's many benefits on Zoom, right? We can all be here today. Uh, but also another one is the chat in that we can kind of get reactions in real time and know what people are thinking if they choose to share it. So feel free to do that. I have it disabled so it won't distract me. Thank you. Um, so yes, as was mentioned, um, 
I created this, the first, as far as I know, and only graphic memoir, uh, full length graphic memoir by a nurse. And I thought I would use some panels from it to introduce you to explaining how I became an AIDS nurse. And then after that, I'll explain how I became a cartoonist. Um, so the year is 1993 um, and any sort of, um, uh, well, I'll skip that part for now. I'll just stick with the text. The first day of my medical clinical rotation in nursing school, I told my instructor that I needed to quit. What, why, what happened? I'm standing in the medical unit, staring down the long hallway. It smells of floor wax and elevator dings in the distance. The man in the wheelchair is to be my patient for the day. My job is to help him wash, dress, make his bed, be sure he eats, investigate his medications, document his biggest problems, formulate a care plan for them. S, subjective information. O, objective information. A, assessment. P, plan. Here you go. S, my eyes have relayed information to my brain and my body is reacting. Elevated pulse, respirations, di diaphoresis. O, the man in the wheelchair bears a strong resemblance to my now deceased dad. A, this is a bad idea. P, quit. I graduated from college three years earlier with a degree in English and philosophy. Look out world, here I come. But the best job I could get was making copies and sorting tax forms. Uh, we need 500 bound copies of that before you can go home, bye. I gotta get out of here. I wanted to be a writer, but my attempts were just dreadful. One thing I knew I was good at was taking care of sick people. I had been tutored since childhood by my mom, a nurse with seemingly magical powers to make hospital corners, grab a point, lift, push, talk, perfect triangle, got it? My dad had been my first patient. He had a debilitating stroke when I was 17. Oh, it smells so fresh and clean in here, how nice. Good, I gave dad a bath, he's napping now. For seven years, my mom, brother, and I cared for dad at home in hospitals and rehab centers and at the very end in a nursing home. Where's mom? I got dinner. She's down the hall helping the nurses. There were tons of ads for nursing jobs in the paper. My brother's sitting there. Why don't you become a nurse? I can't do math. Science is too hard. Don't be an idiot. I teach high school chemistry. I'll help you. Really? Well, I will never ever forget the look on mom's face when I told her, mom, I'm thinking about going back to school to become a nurse. So back at nursing school, just go home for today, get some rest, come back tomorrow. I'll figure out something, I'll figure something out by then. The next day, go to the other side of the floor, seven north. I've set you up the private clinical rotation with AIDS patients. You'll learn everything you need to know to be a great nurse and your patients won't remind you of your dad. Okay. At that moment, despite being 13 years into the AIDS pandemic, despite over 270,000 deaths from AIDS in the US, nearly 7,000 of them in Chicago, I knew very little about AIDS. It hadn't been on TV or in newspapers. Famous diagnoses and deaths, early fear, heroism, and a red ribbon stamp, distant things, safe things. My instructor was right. I would learn from AIDS what I needed to know to be a good nurse, that sometimes there's little we can do to help, but we should always try. Are you sure we can't convince you to stay? You're very, very sick. No way, I'm off to the riverboat to try my luck. I die either way. And often the things that help people the most are not what we might expect. Hey, my cable TV just went back on. What'd you do down there? I'm not sure, but I'm glad it worked. My second day on Seven North, my patient was going home, so it didn't need much help. Not that I had any to offer. You know where I wanna die? Pardon me. After just those first two days, I felt a connection, a reinvestment, one strong enough to keep me in nursing school. You did good today, kid. Good luck with school. So uh, I, I graduated from nursing school. I ended up going into AIDS care as a result of that experience. And um, because I was originally educated in, in the humanities, I wanted to process the difficult experiences I was having and sort of all of what was unfolding around me during the AIDS crisis. And so I would go to a sushi restaurant near the hospital before work. I worked a three to 11 shift, so I'd go there for lunch and I would just write in journals. 
but as things compounded and things got worse and more patients that I grew to care very close, grew very close with and care very much died um, because our patients stayed a very long time at that time, telling those stories actually become, became re-traumatizing. And I had no time off, right? I was just always uh, kind of thinking about work and that wasn't helping anymore. So at night I would go home after the three to 11 shift and stayed up till two, three, four in the morning, painting these screens, these attempts to sort of memorialize people I'd cared about and process those experiences that we'd shared. But I felt although ultimately those weren't telling the stories. They weren't really conveying the whole narrative. And you got to understand, I started out as the kid who could not draw in school, the kid who was told to put the crayons away, that, you know, images weren't something I could work with. So I wasn't quite as skilled as I wanted to be in telling the whole story in images alone. Then one day, I desperately needed to deal with uh, caring for a patient who I had loved very much for the whole four or five years that they'd, I'd worked there. Um, I knew their whole family, and this person died. And it sort of felt almost cumulative that this loss toward the end of the time when our unit even needed to exist because new meds had come out, I didn't know how to deal with it. Plus we were losing our unit as a whole anyway. So, but I also needed to go to work the next day and be present to my patients. And again, I turned to the page to try to figure out how something from the arts and the humanities could help me. And I literally just drew this picture of myself. And then I put a few words over it. And then I just put a box around that. And since there was one box, upper left corner of the page, I just put another box. And I realized, oh, it's a comic. Linda Berry makes these comics that I love called Ernie Poog's Comique, and they're not funny. They talk about difficult topics. I'll just keep going. So I wrote a few more words, drew a few more images, and I just kept going. And rather than take you through the nine panel comic this turned into, the first comic I ever made, I wanna take you to the abstract and tell you that what happened that day was I started here, and by moving a little bit in image and text through these panels, I'd found myself here and I'd found it. I'd found the thing that I needed to help me go on and cope. And as our unit closed and as I moved on into the world, trying to figure out what I was going to do next, I kept making comics. And I don't expect you to read these. These are three of my earliest comics. But basically, anytime I had a question or a struggle or a problem, I realized that this is the medium that worked for me. And again, I was not the kid who could draw. I was not the kid who ever had skills. And so I thought, well, I want to make more comics about this experience I've had over the last six years working as an AIDS nurse. What do I need to know? And I suppose one could argue I could have gone to art school and actually learned to draw, but I kind of like my goofy childlike style and my crazy use of color. And I decided I wanted to study theory instead. Um, we're not going to read through all this. I'm sorry. I apologize. I thought I'd cut this, but basically it's a story of a clinical situation in which I wasn't sure if I'd done the right thing and doing the comic proved to me that um, I had, or that it didn't even matter. But again, I took my questions and my struggles to this medium. Um, and I realized that what I wanted to study was actually uh, contained within a field that was at that time called medical humanities and bioethics is now called uh, more, more broadly health humanities. And what that was, was why does story help us heal? How did just telling those stories in that proper medium help me heal? And what could be learned? And so when I talk about stories in healthcare, I often talk about the ways, uh, a situation where say there's two moms that drop their kids off at daycare every day. And one day one of the moms shows up with their arm in a cast and the other mom just doesn't look at her and walk away. The other mom needs something, right? She needs a story. She needs an explanation for what happened between yesterday and today that accounts for this change in your status, this cast on your arm. Obviously, there's a story there. And, I, and we, you know, we want to know what those stories are. But as people who experience changes in our health experience, also, we want to tell stories. And this is where some of the most interesting work is, right? In narrative theory, what is the work that the stories are doing as we tell them and as we retell them and as we edit them and as we sort of construct them in different ways? How are they helping us? How are they holding us back. All of this narrative theory, this uh, parts of the field called narrative medicine, were something I was completely absorbed in. And all of the areas of the humanities and the arts, if you think about it, work with story, right? Bioethics itself is actually just stories of things that happen and how we can manage them, right? Towards the end of my studies, and I had been keeping them kind of on the down low, I wanted to be taken seriously as a scholar. Um, so I wasn't telling people I was doing all this academic work just to make comics. But then this book changed everything. I came across this in the Museum of Contemporary Art Bookstore, and it's an amazing book that 
first of all, just looking at the cover, that was an image that was very, very um, familiar to me clinically, but not anything I'd ever seen on the front cover of a book, particularly in comic form. The guy who created this book, Brian Feast, he said, comics were the right medium for the story I wanted to tell. They meld words and pictures to convey an idea with more economy and grace than either could alone. And he said later, a comic takes reality and pairs away everything that's unnecessary until you get to the heart of that experience. And I realized that when I read this book, that 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 was it. That was the essence of why this worked for me. And reading this book particularly made me realize that these comics are actually, if our families, our patients, our healthcare providers are making these stories, we get these windows into these experiences that we never get in a hospital or a clinic. We get to see what life at home is like. We get to see what that that kind of lived experience of illness is. And I thought, wow, why aren't medical students reading these books? Why aren't healthcare providers reading these to understand what our patients go through and to provide better care? Comics provide this excellent way to access our stories. They build one bit at a time. They help us to organize our thoughts and feelings, right? I'm someone who's really overwhelmed by the big picture. We'll break things down into little boxes and put them sequentially, and I can process information that way. They combine word and image, and we know that our brains are doing different things when they work in word and image. And they can oddly even be fun, or maybe funs is too strong of a word, a pleasurable experience, even when a very hard topic is discussed. I've actually worked in advanced care planning. So people planning for their own death, their own de decline in their health, using comics as a way to enter into those difficult conversations. So the next question I asked is, are there more of these books? Are there more of these books that are not like Brian's that are nonfiction by adults of four adults about the things we experience with our health and our body. And it turns out over the last 10 years, 10 to 15 years, this field has exploded. These are eight books just about the process of trying to get pregnant, having a child, perinatal loss and postpartum depression. Um, th these books span a wide range of fields. Um, these are a whole number of books aimed at adolescents and young adults that cover topics like um, racial injustice and addiction, obviously the, the kind of sexuality and body changes happening at that time and even death itself. Um, these are three that cover cancer. There are many, many more that do that work. Um, Alzheimer's, uh, mental health, PTSD, anxiety. These are all books that talk about natural death and dying and hospice experiences. And so this field has, has really exploded. And again, these are nonfiction books by people living with these experiences that kind of give us a guide and show us what these experiences are like. And it's a way to bear witness to them visually. Our field also has expanded to include things like looking at the way in which war and, and um, migration has impacted our physical health. Also, of course, climate change and the ways climate change impact our health. And so this whole field, um, as I said, is about people who are living through experiences. And I truly believe as a nurse that those best positioned to represent illness and caregiving are those living with it. And that's the, the kind of slogan of the um, disability rights movement, nothing about us without us. Um, and so this field has become to come to know and uh, known as graphic medicine. So what is graphic medicine? Um, graphic medicine refers to the interface between the medium of comics and the discourse of health, illness, disability, and caregiving. And that term was coined by Ian Williams in 2008. And he's a doctor who also makes comics. We have a website um, where if you're interested, you can learn more about graphic medicine. We've been very active with COVID, um, kind of talking about educational comics and then creating community. So, you know, the main things that, that comics, and I can talk more about this if people are interested in, and healthcare come together to do are to kind of the work of graphic medicine really is around um, reading comics and graphic, graphic narratives for provider and patient education. Comics are an incredibly powerful educational tool, um, but then also to reflect and problem solve through that. Um, for that reading. And then making comics to encourage reflection on experience, trauma, professional practice, and all that we go through with our bodies. Kind of, you know, my own example of why this worked for me being a great example. There's a lot of interesting work about particularly bearing witness to trauma through comics, because comics give you agency over a situation, um, maybe over which you had no agency, right? You get to make all the decisions. 
Um, and comics are a tremendous uh, intervention in research um, in both uh, as the intervention itself, using a comic to teach or using a comic to uh, deal with a difficult situation, but also to translate research that maybe no one would read unless you make it more interesting by turning it into a comic. And then the last thing I want to gesture to is the ways in which comics create community. Um, the logo there, the drawing together is something that we did during COVID to get providers and patients and people together every week to just draw uh, to a prompt and share and talk and just community um, is incredibly important in graphic medicine. We also, as was mentioned, we have annual conferences. So I think I'm going to stop there. Um, I have uh, other things, but I think I'll wait to see if they come up in the Q&A to share more. I'm going to be mindful of my time. Let's see if I'm turned on. Thank you, um, MK. Um, really appreciate um, uh, the um, light and quick and uh, deeply informative uh, biographical sketch, and and at the same time, you're you're um, uh, laying out uh, the field and what the what the field of graphic medicine does and can do. Um, it's, it's really. Um, uh, sort of breathtaking. Uh, so I'm, thank you. Lots to lots to talk about, and and it, uh, definitely love to invite you to share more if you have you know more uh, more to prepared for us. But um, I think it's 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 good now to go to our our next uh, 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 artist presenter today. Um, Priyanka Jain uh, comes to us from uh, late at night in Kolkata in India, um, and um, her. Uh, uh, kind of formal presentation uh, and performance will uh, has been recorded, so we'll start with a recording. But she's here with us uh, also in the Zoom environment, so we'll we'll speak together live after that. Um, Priyanka Jane's research aims to open the field of picture recitation to contemporary sensibilities, for which she uses. Oh, oh, sorry, that's okay. <laughs> uh, I'll I'll finish the intro. Um, uh, to open the field of con picture recitation con to contemporary sensibilities for which she uses ideas from the sciences to compose new narratives. This presentation includes two picture recitation performances, as well as a short discussion on how arts and science merge in with Indian aesthetics. Priyanka Jain has studied fine arts in India and Germany and is currently a PhD candidate at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Her research involves contemporizing ancient Indian picture recitation traditions with new narratives from microbiology and neuroscience. She works in various mediums, including drawing, stop motion animation, and artist book publications. So now we'll turn it over to Priyanka's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this artist talk. I'm a visual artist currently based in India, and I'm exploring the practice of narrative picture recitation as a research creation project at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Before I begin, I would like to say that my personal affinity for narratives was established very early on in my practice. For example, this is a narrative sculpture made as a second year art student, which depicts the story of my eyes, my visit to the optometrist to get new glasses and eye drops. And it was influenced by not only Indian, but also Roman narrative relief carvings. To this, I would like to add that India has a long tradition of picture recitation in various formats. Picture recitation is the art of prosometric storytelling using a visual prop. For example, this painted cloth is called far. It is often up to seven meters long and depicts the story of a local deity and is used for storytelling in Western India. Here you can see a scroll painter singing her scroll about the coronavirus and on the right, is a wooden box with hinged panels being used for the recitation. 
This wooden box is known as a cardboard. I am interested in adapting these and many other devices for visual and oral storytelling. For example, this is my cover illustrating a near future social fiction about the insurance industry and the story unfolds sequentially as the various hinged panels are revealed. Now, without delay, let me perform for you my first piece of picture recitation, which was composed as a series of charcoal drawings in 2014 and the oral component was composed four years later. Since we are doing this digitally, I have tried to draw your attention to certain parts of the images as I would have done by pointing with my fingers during a face-to-face -face performance. So before I begin, I invite you to read the prologue of this picture recitation titled Homo Calculus. Jet black lungs of a chain smoker like a jet black god carved by Michelangelo. Red pimples inside the skin of the small intestine caused by eating a lot of spicy food that no beauty cream can remove. Light shines through thin slices of belly fat that hang like modern art lampshades I have come to see an exhibition of body parts preserved in vitrines and showcases. Two slices of breast tissue catch my eye. One has cancer, the other has not. They whisper like a TV ad sponsor. Breastfeeding reduces the risk of breast cancer. Cancer is like a rabbit that multiplies faster than our profits gnawing at our tissues than hippity hippity hobbits to the blood, to the bone, never leaving you alone. Drink probiotics for gut bacteria. Red wine is great for the heart today. Omega-3 should be in your cooking oil. Popular science has a lot to say, but oh my, oh my, so much money to raise a child I have not, and so must I die, for I breastfeed cannot. Then to a cost analyst I must go. Cost analyst is a new word for an old profession of our pecuniary obsession with saving pennies and spending pounds. Our new worlds are populated with such fancy words like consultants and logistics and geopolitical dynamics. To the analyst, I say the weighing scales have spoken. A baby weighs more than all the money I can gather. Still, I would rather not die of cancer. I pray thee for an answer. The analyst with his sunken skull hasn't faced a problem such as this, but confidently recollects previous similar case studies, then morphing into a scientist begins calculating how long I must breastfeed. How long will it take to make strong immune cells? Cells that can soar high in the sky like eagles with sharp eyes and raise the sharp claws that can swoop down under my skin and catch the rabbit that gnaws at my tissues like a bomb squad that can defuse the dynamite at the nick of time. Almost a year it will take. How much does it cost to raise a baby for a year? There is a baby cost calculator on the internet where you can add up the cost of your pickles, the cost of massages, the cost of sonographs and other medical charges, normal delivery or C-sections, diaper creams and baby lotions, baby alarms and vaccinations, blankets, prams and jiggling toys, pink for girls and blue for boys. Let's add it on an abacus. 
for we, the homo calculus, must first get scared of the huge amount a baby will be costing us. Alternatively, if there was a policy to cover me, insurance is not prevention, but, but an assurance that I would have some backup. The analyst starts shooting me with questions like poison darts. What is your age? Do you smoke? Do you drink? Are you obese? What of diabetes? Do you jog and exercise or party every weekend thrice? What is your family history? What disease is in your family tree? Current cost of living index, prospective rates of inflation, capital taxes and currency crashes, these thousand factors in calculation quotes me a premium that I cannot afford to pay. They pause for a moment's breath. In his eyes, I see wisdom glow. He smiles and says clear and slow, motherhood has its benefits. Not only can you save yourself from the disease of the breast, but also no unwanted guests will burrow into your ovaries and dig out your precious eggs. Calcium that flows out in the milk is restored even more densely in your brittle bones, pending of osteoporosis. Lower levels of estrogen, lower chances of damaged genes, being flooded with happy hormones is every lactating mother's bliss. Weight loss, fat reduction, almost like a liposuction is divine providence, a new confidence to face the world. Motherhood is a once in a life experience. My thoughts turn inwards. The pros and cons I try to weigh a baby in the present day or a future risk of sorrow and a constant fear that I may have cancer tomorrow. An actress, very famous, chopped off her breast at the altar of preventive surgery before facing the guillotine of risk. A cost-benefit analysis I too must make. Alas, that it has come to this. These breasts tip like weighing scales heavily down with fear. Fear of potential risks for the unknown, the unseen make life so dear. Suddenly, an inner voice, my mind wanders away. Do not drink milk from a cow that sheds so much methane, that feeds off so much grass, so much water goes down the drain. Such huge carbon footprint like a Yeti's footprint, not seen by any, but confirmed by many. Drink soya milk instead. We have cut down so many trees and rendered so many apes homeless so that you can avoid dairies. We have also burnt those dead trees and cleared up the land so we can grow soya which we will soak and we will press into nutrition in the name of progress. Cost-benefit analysis shifts factories from one country to another. But why am I thinking of this? Oh, it's so difficult to decide any any advice, any guide? Should I toss a coin or roll a dice? Hear me out, the analyst says. Let me quote a modest proposal by Jonathan Swift. Swift, a pastor in Dry Barren, Ireland, consoled the poor with sound advice. Sell your one-year-olds, he said, as delicate, delicious one-pound meat. Two shillings, he said, is all it takes to nurse a child for 52 weeks. Ten shillings worth it is for the rich who would love to re relish their roasted cheeks. Eight shillings profit every year is Spanish gold for the poor. Plus, the infant baby's tender skin, even without proper tanning, makes excellent gloves and shoes. The patriotic baby would have paid his dues to increase national GDP with the canned meat industry. The global export of this local meat will correct our trade deficit. Dear lady, herein lies the clue to what even you can do to prevent yourself from disease. You can do whatever you please, like animal testing for cosmetics, birth a baby to lower your risks, 
feed it till your immunity grows after which you can gently dispose the growing lump it's cost effective no school fees you will have to give every deed for personal safety is your birthright your top priority no ifs and buts to deliberate make haste go and procreate a few months later the happy ultrasound the fetus grows as if it already knows its sole purpose is to suckle and feed with diligence and greed starts training within the womb like a Chinese Olympic kid. A year goes by, the child turns one and like a fairy godmother come to grant her boon under the door slips in a paper. Ah, the analyst did remember. At such and such time, on such and such date, call me at this number and distract my thoughts astray when you come to take the kid, I say. One day, the phone rings. For a moment, I close my eyes, my thoughts wander a dreamy maze. In a flash of blinding ray, a transaction has taken place. Three boxes replace a living child. Three boxes like in Shakespeare's play. The first holds a key to room 101. Is this a joke from an Orwellian book? What is my worst fear that I must face here? So much I have already done. Must I also pass through these swinging knives? So much peril in such short knives? I am no juggling acrobat. Or a prince of Persia. These weapons have a familiar strangeness. Like something slightly out of place. I wonder where I have seen these before. I wonder what treasures await me beyond. What divine prophecy, what divine words are that hang in mango swaying in the breeze I come closer the words get sharper way more sharper than a swinging dagger delivering a fatal blow I cannot defend you have now reduced your risk of breast cancer by 2% so much effort such petty returns an absurd feeling i am i am lost for words perhaps this is the curse of the homo calculus a pang of guilt my sorrow grows louder, ready to burst. My heart sinks lower. But let me first open up the second box. Perhaps therein lies a detox that can cleanse me of my sins. What is this? A lamp that throws not light but shadows? Shadows that encircle me like hyenas, vultures and crows. Shadows that are darker than the night. Shadows that highlight my loneliness. I am a caveman meeting a ghost and the voice of the lamp beckons me. That which has been done lies in the past. There is no U-turn. It cannot be undone. The shadow of a piggy bank pig kisses my cheek and says, Do not be weak. Think of all the money you saved that is safely tucked in my belly. Your weakened heart must not rule your head. Hear the jingling of the penny safely tucked in my belly.
No drop of tear should fall on the floor, for the tear is a seed from which sorrow can grow into a mighty demon with long ears and gigantic teeth that burrows under your skin and gnaws at your bone marrow. Yes, cancer can also be caused by depression and sorrow. Silently, I wipe my tear for I am not allowed to cry anymore. I inhale back all the sorrow in a last sniff, in a last sigh, before I turn my eye to the third box. Medicines lie in hiding there like soldiers in the Trojan horse come to wage war within on gentle hormones named oxytocin. Have you ever wondered why we cuddle a puppy or smile at another person? Why do we humans bond? What makes a mother give her all and share her milk with her baby? The source of our empathy lies in these gentle hormones called oxytocin, seen here symbolically in the image of a dog. Let me quickly describe the battles that begin as soon as the medicine enters my mouth. The battle is quick and not very dramatic. The medicine named antioxin suppresses the hormone oxytocin and immune cells that come to intervene to block the murderer's path, unable to face his acidic venom must take flight to save their skin. The murderer then attacks the memory and plunders it. It loots the milk reserves till not a drop is left, despite the ravages and the loss. I feel not bereft, a very strange battle this is that spreads enormous bliss. Accumulating on the battleground, the dead bodies are countless, yet the more medicines I take, the less guilty I feel. I am submerged in anaesthetic happiness. A year goes by, a new day starts. I find myself again in an exhibition of body parts. So absorbed are we in self-discovery, solo audience to the drama unfolding within our body, so absorbed are we decoding every gene knowing everything till nothing remains unknown. So absorbed are we navigating the cosmos of our hearts that slices of our brains and tissues have become the most spectacular of all the arts. Here, here is a bed of tiny nerves at the sole of the feet that makes us giggle so hard. There, a neural tube forming in a four-week fetus that develops into its spinal cord. Light shines through thin slices of brain tissue like artisanal candies, very delicious. These are masterpieces made by the geniuses of the species Homo calculus. This, this slice of the brain could be my own could be a mirror reflecting my fate, like a farmland neglected with oxytocin decaying in heaps of dead doggies while injured immune cells battered by chemicals of antidepressants watch helplessly those rabbits multiply faster than our profits. Before one chapter terminates, a new one could begin and thus forever will spin the cycle of cause and effects. Get a cat to kill a rat and bring a dog to scare that cat and just like that in circles we forever go and thus never ends the curse of the homo calculus. From realizing that I liked narratives to actually submitting myself to this amalgamation of picture, text and performance that is picture recitation has been a long journey and I would like to introduce you to my current practice and research since 2020. 
The field of picture recitation was negatively affected during colonization by the British in India since many narratives were based on Hindu mythology, the erotic aspects of which were considered obscene by the British. Thus, not only the imposition of Victorian morality and Protestant prudery, but also our own self-censorship to mimic and please our colonizers affected the expression of the theme of passion through art, literature and storytelling. One of the major scholars of decolonization, Walter Mignolo, says it is time to delink oneself from the tyranny of Western hegemony and invest in that which has been silenced and make visible what has been rendered invisible to affirm the presence of what has been declared absent. In my practice of decolonizing, I am looking at the aesthetics of the past traditions of erotic poetry written in Sanskrit and medieval Indian miniature painting and merging them with contemporary knowledge from the sciences to create erotic poetry in English and placing them in digital illustrations. The basic narrative of my erotic verses comes from research about the human microbiome, which states that microbes in the gut communicate with the brain via the spinal cord and affect our moods and behaviors. I extrapolate these observations to include the microbes of the skin and imagine how various fluids and atmospheric phenomena interact with the skin microbiome and how the various foods eaten during the various seasons provides nutrients for the gut microbes, which then cascade further chemical reactions in my body, which ultimately makes me love, kiss, caress and hug my lover. Mustardy carrots bathed in bubbling brine soak the sun in my stead and father new neurons in my head. The neurons sparkle fireworks of dopamine and oxytocin when smooth bedsheets churn ferocious waves that smash the pillow boats. Referring to the forests of microbes lining my skin and intestines, I have titled my series of illustrations, The Forest on My Flesh. My tongue sweeps over a dome of palm jaggery, jiggling the jaggery into a creamy caramel custard. As the streptococcus of my throat cuddle the proteobacteria of your hinds, your bums twitch at the Richter scale of one. Delighted, my tongue sticks out once again. From microbial lovers, now let me take you back to lovers in classical Indian arts through whom the erotic affect was conveyed. Dramatists and authors used different archetypes of lovers to describe the different phases and sentiments of a romantic relationship. For example, they suggested eight kinds of heroines displaying eight different sentiments regarding their union with their lovers. Seven of these eight heroines wait for their lover to come to them, while only one goes out to meet her lover, often braving grave dangers. This archetype of a female lover or heroine is named Abhisarika. Many miniature paintings depict her running through a dark forest infested with demons and snakes on a stormy night with lightning cracking above her head and in a posture where she turns to look back at her ankle belts that have slipped off her foot, but she is in such a hurry that she does not pick them up. In the following picture recitation, I ponder why runs the Apisarika. Lightning rips apart the bonds of nitrogen that spins down the raindrops to the actinomycetes of the soil. 
who joyfully diffuse petrichoral bouquets of chiosmin and tyrosine that waft into lovers nostrils becoming dopamine in the mesolimbic pathways of the brain the dopamine needs its own bard and ballad to sing of all it risks in pursuit of pleasure suppresses inhibitions makes us go get it setting heroines on new adventures the lightning of such storms illuminate the experimental arts lovers discover and for those with no erotic manuscripts to guide the best love is still made on a stormy night lightning that splits nitrogen bonds lovers cascading its atoms from cloud to soil from raindrops to fragrance to fireworks of dopamine in lovers cerebrums but should the alleyways of dopamine dead end when oblong pillows replace a lover the fireworks explode within their crates the moonbeams sting the stormy night suffocates precisely when the first lightning strikes irons of the air shiver her skin shiver the beads of her ankle bells her feet cross the threshold and she bolts swelled with dopamine the abhisarika races she fears not snakes nor the forest ghouls rather flees the fireworks of an empty bed and the moonbeams that will cinder her lonely soul lightning custodian of the erotic arts paid homage to inverses and paints cosmic repository of sexual power sets lovers to work in an instant flash a torch that keeps itself alive with energy spent by lovers in union but for those too lonely to pay tribute it constricts and alights in carnal flames <gasps> scared to miss out on her oblation scared of cinders the abhisarika runs who is afraid of earthwormy snakes in front of the cosmic serpent's fangs lightning source of rasa the primeval life force in megawatts and kilojoules compressed of millennia of kisses and embraces not only of humans but all life forms i hope you enjoyed the various kinds of picture recitation performances and i wish you a lovely day ahead thank you thank you priyanka and glad you you're with us in real time as well as uh, recorded time. Um, so thank you so much for those two um, performed poems and um, uh, beautiful images. Um, so I think we can turn into more of a round table uh, now. I don't know if we can, yeah, see everybody <laughs> on the screen. Uh-oh. Um, um, Claire and I are here in the, um, the fourth space, and uh, we also have some folks tuning in um, who have commented uh, a bit throughout. Whoops. Is that, me? Is that me? A little bit of ambient clanging and banging, but I think we're good. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, those of you uh, tuning in through Zoom um, have been putting comments in the chat. and. <laughs> I think there's a way you can be heard, right? So we can open it up for your questions. But I'd like to start with having the three uh, presenters just maybe start by um, saying a word or two about uh, what you uh, what you noticed in each other's work or 
comments on each other's work or connections you see, uh, certainly there's um, a rather beautiful thematic of um, the, um, to use Claire's term from, from, uh, from Exquisite Corpse, the hurricane within the body, um, the, the, the uh, multitude of activities and processes and um, yeah, just, uh, just uh, circulations that go on in the body all the time to keep us going. And um, uh, Priyanka, in your, in your metaphoric world, that turns into a kind of hurricane of economic calculations and, um, uh, and uh, as you say, cost-benefit analysis all the time. Um, and um, MK, it's wonderful. I, one thing I'd love to uh, have all of, all of you maybe say a word about um, is the role of uh, pedagogy, the way storytelling is um, uh, can be used to teach us about the body, but also um, uh, more than that, the way uh, these tools can be shared. And, um, you know, I, I love that MK, you sort of saw uh, a couple of graphic novels and that that triggered a desire to like find the medium that you you sort of recognize the medium as as what you needed to work with that that was so exciting. And I think when people see picture recitations when they see Kentastoria performances when they see graphic graphic novels or comics something something clicks and they say oh I can tell a story MK as you said in a in a pared down way how how do comics allow us to pare down to what we absolutely need to to say or tell in a given story or to teach about a given um, health issue or you know embodied process it's uh, it's so valuable and we we drown in excess of language and excess of information especially with the access we have um, on the internet we have we have we're sort of drowning in too much information and it's so great to see how uh, these works pare it down to a kind of poetry of, of what we really need to know. Um, but let me turn it over to all of you. Do you want to start? I... Uh, one thing that comes to mind also that brings together um, the work that we're doing is, is this notion of sort of sequential image and text in combination and conversation, right? But then also the other thing is the powerful uses of metaphor, right? I didn't really talk about the ways in which um, my medium can do that, but I, it is alive in, in both of the ways that you're working as well, because we kind of think about and contemplate what happens in our bodies and what happens in our health and our lives metaphorically. And these media can make those metaphors visual and, and bring on, like, especially I was just thinking about in both of the pieces you performed, the um, just the important rhetorical work happening through the metaphors made visual. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's 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 like parallel worlds. Um, you know, the semantic imagery in the mind plus the visual imagery. Um, so there are um, text and image uh, combined together, and it's interesting. Like what one has missed out, the other can say. Um, <clears throat> So even in, in your graphic um, boxes, what, you know, how you're framing the image, where you're cropping the composition of, you know, the space division composition and all those things, it, it matters. And um, uh, same thing for, for Claire's work. I mean, uh, lovely images, uh, it, very abstract uh, and, uh, and, and, and the clarity of the text which, uh, which Claire speaks, uh, it, it actually kind of balances the, the sort of abstract uh, and, and minimal uh, imagery of uh, painted on, on those cloth pieces. I, I just loved the idea of this very simple, I, I hope it was silk or something like that. And, the the kind of drawing and using velcro to 
you know, just attach and turn the images. It's just so lovely. It's so simple. I, I, I cannot fathom something so simple. <laughs> Uh, oh, look at that. Yeah, well, I'm such a Luddite, I don't even know how to unmute my own mic. Um, yeah, that's that's one reason why the, the form really appeals to me and, and appealed to me. And I think that's something that's true of, of comics too, is, is how, how radically accessible they are. You know, like anybody can do that and you don't need fancy materials and you don't need fancy training, you know, those, pictures were painted on old bed sheets with latex house paint. So, you know, it's um, super minimal, super, super um, cheap, easy to do with materials that are really um, easy to get. And um, that's, of course, was like one of the first basic uh, reasons why Contestoria appealed to me was, was it's accessible, it's easy to do, it's lightweight, you can carry it, you can roll up the scroll and stick it under your arm and walk down the street with it. Um, and all of those things just make it incredibly approachable. And that that is a wonderful thing about, um, I think about picture storytelling in general. Um, I wonder if, if any of you can share uh, or, or address maybe this question of um, how you pass on the technique. Like I think I've found, and, and this is for, a little bit from learning from Claire's festivals and from other, other folks um, in the theater community that's, that primarily works with image-based theater, sometimes puppet theater, sometimes other forms of image-based theater. There's a kind of evangelism for the forms themselves <laughs> and a great desire to share them and teach them and um, uh, show this accessibility to others and and they kind of catch catch fire in that way, I, I, I find. And I wonder if you could address that if you find the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I can address that. Uh, so a lot of, I teach medical students, um, and, uh, and like people bioethicists and like people who have not drawn since they were in about fourth or fifth grade and, uh, feel like that's not something they have access to. So what I always do is bring in a 24 pack of Crayola crayons mm -hmm. and it kind of in plain white paper and it kind of instantly takes you back and removes that barrier of like I can't draw um we just sort of take back to that place when you knew that you could um and we go from there and so yeah I mean I think once it's really quite astonishing once people realize that that making art in the way that I'm presenting it but I mean people can find their own way that they actually have access to something that maybe they thought they didn't um, and that it's not uncommon to people that come to the graphic medicine movement to say things like, I feel like I've, um, you know, we've heard different phrases, like, I feel like I've found the mothership, I feel like I've found my tribe, I feel like I've found, because it's that moment of like, bringing together um, what they've experienced with their health and their maybe desire to express it artistically and in narrative, or it's even their academic work and something that brings them like great joy to just sit and draw and being able to kind of bring the whole person to the work and to this process. Um, I think that's part of what brings this enthusiasm for like, just, yeah, like this is something we have access to and, and we can do. Mm -hmm. Priyanka, did you want to say a word about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said, India had like maybe 27 or I don't know, a, a, a number of picture recitation practices, which has right now dwindled down to maybe three or four, which are still being practiced, but within very small communities. Um, and it's almost like a father to son or father to daughter gen, uh, kind of an arts practice. And it's um, it's folk art, it, mainstream gallery art does not recognize this. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very difficult to actually convince people to take this up as a contemporary practice. Uh, so, and, and that's, the, that's the point why I am doing it as a PhD research to kind of figure out what it takes 
without appropriating any of these folk arts um, and also since they practice in vernacular languages they have a set of myth myth uh, mythological stories on which um, most of their scrolls are based although they are also trying to uh, approach new subject matter so without belonging to such communities without having the heritage of songs and tunes and their style of drawing, um, how to completely as an outsider bring all these things together. So I am from the visual arts, but I have very bad, or I, I don't have any training in actually writing poetry. So that is something that I have to teach myself right now. Um, and through theater workshops, I am trying to train myself into performance. Um, and of course, I mean, making it nice so that I can convey aesthetic pleasure. You know, it has to be nice. It has to be beautiful. Uh, that matters a lot. So, so bringing it into that kind of a ship shape um, thing, uh, it, it is extremely um, time taking and effortful. Um, and um, as, as of now, I feel I'm like in a, in, a, in a relatively blank space where I don't really have contemporaries with whom I can share this uh, in India because it's, um, it's, it's the conventional kind of art practices or it's um, very contemporary new media, film, artificial realities, video art, stuff like that, but nothing really in, in this the space of picture recitation performances right so i have no clue how i'm to pass on something i'm still learning yeah is, is, your, is your you mentioned uh, um 27 forms of picture recitation that have dwindled to a smaller number um are you also in touch with those practitioners and and uh do you have direct contact with them or is it something you're sort of tracking from a distance more as a scholar, or I'm just curious how you're uh, making connections between the living practitioners of the tradition. Uh, I, I am in touch with some of the living practitioners, but I have um, not been able to actually uh, approach them for my research because of the COVID pandemic. And then there would have been um, ethics uh, applications to be fulfilled. And for me, it was more the question like I I know the I know how they are doing it because they are posting it on YouTube and on um, in events um, in craft fairs where they actually sell their stuff. Um, but uh, the performance is just a way to attract people to buy the things, um, buy these boxes for storytelling or buy the strolls. Uh, so I've not really been able to approach them to learn from them. Uh, but also for me, it becomes uncomfortable to think that I might be using their knowledge and not uh, giving back to them in the right way. So as of now, I have not really full-fledgedly put myself in that position. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and sorry, I'm just picking up on what you said about craft fairs and sales. So, I mean, this is something that I know I associate with the European forms of picture recitation, that there's often the performance and then the takeaway little broadside or the printed booklet or, or some other object that the spectator can purchase for very little money and which also makes us think about comics and comic books as something for a mass market and relatively cheap and um, you know something that kids can own and people can have in their homes. Um, so I guess is that something also the case in the Indian tradition that there are these uh, sort of takeaway objects that you can buy alongside the performances? Um, so generally like if um, it's a scroll being performed it would be quite long Right. And that is then more like a gallery object. It's, it's, a, it's an art object rather than a souvenir. 
Um, as a souvenir for a little less money, the artist would be selling just one panel of that scroll and not the entire scroll. Yeah. Um, similarly, in those kind of wooden boxes, you might have a box with just four panels. And as an art object, or if you want to commission one, they would make something which has maybe 10 or 12 boxes, which can really open up to become 10 meters wide or something like that. Um, so, uh, but but um, the, the performance, the, the narrative, the performed narrative, the oral part and the visual part still get separated. So what uh, some of the scroll painters have started doing now is along with the scroll, they uh, stick in a QR code and in that QR code, you can get that live performance or you can um, view the video of the performance as well. So that's a clever way that they're doing it. That makes me think of, of how well I felt you, you both translated your work to the, the Zoom medium as well. Um, and uh, MK using the uh, a kind of sequence, a sequencing of, of uh, frames on the screen uh, alongside your own narration was, was really great. And I felt it's very true to the forms we're talking about. It didn't feel uh, particularly uh, diminished by being in this rather synthetic environment that we're in <laughs> uh, at the moment. Um, uh, and, and, and Priyanka with your work as well, that we saw a little box of you narrating alongside a larger frame of your, of your, of your pictures. Um, it's very beautiful. And uh, that brings me to a, a word that, MK, I'm not sure I heard correctly. I think you said um, simul sequential image. Was it simul, simul sequential image and text? It was a... I probably mispronounced. I, it, yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting reading, but it was it was meant to be sequential image and text. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I like simul sequential. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's a nice yeah, yeah. paradox. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was also thinking about the way the the series of images and the verbal narrative um in picture recitation do not sync up and that's one thing that gives us so much to think about um, so the images of the horses in uh you know room 221 and room 222 where we're not seeing the patients exactly like you didn't paint the patients for us yeah. um but uh rather the the horses the metaphor of their energy and their life force that somehow um, gave rise to their being in the positions they're in. Um, That's really important to me because I think that um, a lot of times you you can really diminish a subject matter by just depicting it, um, you know. And that's like part of the reason why I find this kind of form a little transcendent for me. Uh, it's it's sort of more than like a movie, you know. You can. You can watch a movie where there's actors who are who are dramatizing the sick patient in the bed and the nurse at the bedside and it's all there in front of you. Um, but what this forum can do is is exactly the opposite of that, which is not represent mm. the thing that you're talking about and sometimes I think there's such great value in that in not not showing the thing because um, sometimes the way we show a thing is so inadequate um to the enormity of the thing and what you have to really do is show another thing and that's what lets you get to um the the what the intense truth is around that thing or the experience around that thing without belittling it um, and i think that's tremendously important and that's what i think this form affords and one of the reasons why i'm so attracted to it rather than like making a movie about being a nurse or something like that rebecca who's Duclos, who's joining us here in the space. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to pick up on that. Uh, and I, MK, I think you mentioned it before as well, uh, metaphor and analogy. And I'm, I'm curious to know if um, some of the metaphors and analogies and images and symbols that uh, occur in, in all three of your work um, 
come from a kind of script that has emerged from your your patients, uh, your clients, your community? Are they like was the horse actually uh, an image that um, was expressed to you, Claire, by um, you know either of the the folks with whom you were working? Um, yet, and for both of you, do in the narratives is the are the analogies and metaphors in the mm. script? Do they actually emerge from people with whom you're working? Mm. I would say yes. The answer is yes <laughs> for me, <laughs> for sure. You know, all those things that um, you know uh, come somehow from experience, and the horse, for sure. Um, I think that was actually a real patient experience. You know, somebody came to the ICU because they had a, an accident. They were actually it was a logger who was logging with horses, and they had an accident, and they came to the ICU. They're crushed by one of their horses, but um, but you know, also that's sort of like that that's sort of what's what is the vocabulary of my rural existence you know i live in this deeply rural place and i'm of course like really influenced by just my daily life experience of you know doing my morning chores in the barn and uh and driving past my neighbor's farm and um so of course all that you know um is is what comes to my mind um but i think you know i see those things too you know when i look at a patient in the bed and i think of like everything that's going on inside that body that's fighting so desperately to stay alive um, or whatever it is that it's doing you know um i think sometimes those things just come pop into my head yeah Um, so the things that, that came through my mind as I listened to that question are um, that that the um, the metaphors and the analogies seem to that, that as I review kind of all the graphic novels about different conditions seem to be kind of they come in um, from the culture right uh, maybe metaphors that are common so I'm thinking about a metaphor for the moment of diagnosis with Parkinson's from a book called My Degeneration of a piano just falling down between him and his doctor. Um, you know, this, this, this kind of feels like, um, you know, he's showing us what that felt like. And again, the great thing about the medium is you can make those metaphors visual in those encounters, but also it feels like that's like something the culture would understand. Like, yeah, this piano comes crashing down. Um, or I'm thinking about just, um, yeah, different ways that we convey a lot of something that comes up very often in graphic novels uh, around illness and health are games because the healthcare system feels like such a game. So, you know, in mom's cancer, there's a version of the game operation made into a comic. There's versions of uh, in cancer vixen, a board game where you're going from, you know, spinning the dice and going from place to, and that's something that comes up a lot in these books is trying to navigate the system as if it's a game um, for your health. And so these things kind of emerge from the larger culture that show up as sort of a powerful visual manifestations in these texts as people try to express what their experience has been like. Um, same for me. Um, like, for example, Homo Calculus, actually, um, the idea came up when I visited a exhibition of Body Worlds, and I actually saw this slice of breast tissue and stuff like that. Um, and um, now we, uh, for my research, I'm reading into microbiology and neuroscience, and um, it completely affects my day-to-day -day life and vocabulary. Um, so I actually observe myself uh, touching vegetables and thinking that uh, the, the, the microbes of my hand are eating the juice of the potato and whatever. And, um, and and it's kind of like with COVID, we, we've become so good at contact tracing. I, I do this contact tracing constantly throughout the whole day um, that the, the, the breeze of spring is bringing in uh, microbes from the throat of the kaku onto my skin or whatever. I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, like imagining everything the whole day. Um, and it is from, from these very personal or um, uh, at times from what I'm reading uh, in the news, which seems absurd to me, or, you know, it's like, yeah, we've been through that. We, you know, uh, you know, those kind of um, going around in circles, kind of stories of progress. 
that uh, interest me. So it definitely there is a there is an element of the self in all these stories and narratives. Yeah, I I, I love the um, the analysis of the different forms of milk as a form of cow milk to soy milk as a form of progress and uh, um, thinking about health benefits, carbon footprint, everything. Um, yeah, it's great. There's a question. So folks who are tuning in can write on the in the Q&A and the chat. I was following the chat and neglected the Q&A, but there's a question there um, um, that has to do with the transform transferability of, of this uh, these media to zoom or to virtual performance um, and uh, the question has to do with the impact of the work um, uh, where you as the creator performers become the conduit of the effective experience of the content could you talk about some of the impact the live performance has is there a live performance for the comic Oh, Priyanka, I'll let you answer that first since you're more steeped in performance. <laughs> I'll come back with my little answer. Yeah, great. Um, it, of course, um, it was very difficult. Um, I wanted to give that feeling of live performance, and that is why I did that performance in one shot uh, for the homo calculus. Uh, so there are a few mistakes, but I let them be in there. Uh, I did not want to edit it and make a video. I wanted to give that feel of performance. Um, and um, But I was not sure there might be glitches in Zoom or with internet connections. So I didn't want to perform it right now sitting on the table. But I wanted to give that feeling that I would be performing it sitting on this table. That is why I didn't get up. And I would have been able to show more of my body. Um, so you missed out. Uh, three quarters of my body, right. first of all, in the performance. Um, and uh, uh, I think voice, that um, all, all aspects of voice and uh, just being in that space uh, every single time is a unique experience in a theater. I think that is what uh, is missing. Uh, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. The breath. Yeah. My my breath and my microbes passing on to you. <laughs> yeah, I, for me, live performance is um, completely essential and is is very uh, a, a totally different experience from from doing a thing on the screen or for for the screen um, and and that's because yeah there's there's chemistry between you and the people watching and there's there's energy flowing back and forth and and you it definitely shapes a performance for sure and it definitely makes a performance um, it changes it changes depending on who you're looking at and who you're performing for and what they're what they're giving back to you and um, you know that said, you know, I think it's very interesting to think about one generally thinks about a comic, you know, as a, as a, as a, an experience you can have privately, where you can like hold the book mm -hmm. and hold it really close to your, to your face and your heart and have your own experience and your exchange with that, with that book, the materiality of it is also really important, like how heavy the page feels and what the size, the format of the book is and how heavy it is or light or, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's a, the physical, the physical relationship is so important. Um, it is to, you know, and so I think again, with the screen, there's like sort of these physical aspects that were, that are diff it's difficult to find those in, in the screen performance and in the screen experience of a comic. 
Yeah. Yeah. It makes me realize I should have physical copies of the book to show you like what size it is. And yeah, right. I agree with all of that. So um, hands holding it. Or... Yeah. Right. Right. I, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with that a thousand percent. Like when my, my first book was coming out, like the kind of paper and the fact that the publisher took care to pay attention to that was so important to me, especially because I was conveying story that was just like, so essential to me. And it's like, yeah, you're making this an object and it's got to be a beautiful object. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that said, I'm also a huge fan of performance comics. I think comics make great performances. Um, uh, you know, when cartoonists get together in conferences, often they'll have an event where, you know, the image will come up and the cartoonist will perform it. And sometimes you get other people in the audience to read, like, could you play the voice of my mom or whatever? Um, and I just love that. I love that aspect of it, the perform performativity of comics. Um, and I never really thought about it a lot uh, as something that I wanted to do until we started doing those events. And then I had a, edited an anthology of comics about menopause that came out in um, uh, that came out in uh, during the pandemic, and so we couldn't have any um, kind of live events. And so what I, as far as book launch, and so what I had asked was for each of the cartoonists to send in a one minute video that had images and then their voice speaking, and it just made me realize like that was just like, oh, wow, like like how cool it is to have all of the voices literally that I could hear their voices. And it's yeah, it's a yes. And I think it's um, it's like, a uh, yeah, it's, it's a yes. And but I'm seeing in the comments that someone said that the question, maybe they had a different thought there. Yeah. So our uh, Ulla Neuberg was going to who asked the question was going to jump in and do a follow up. Can we hear you, Ulla? Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Hi, I thank you so much, all three of you. That was uh, amazing and um, uh, uh, very um, thought provoking. And I was, in a way, I was more thinking about rather than the technicalities of different performance media, I was thinking about the intimacy of you as the creators uh, that you create with your subject matter. And I, I found that the uh, um, to me as a viewer um, and perhaps as a person with a, with a serious disease, uh, I very much enjoyed the, the jumping from your sort of positionality as a viewer and creator to these sort of micro images of uh, physical experience, um, uh, <laughs> be it the forest on your, on your skin or uh, be it, uh, be it, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, more metaphorical images, as you mentioned, MK. But the um, I'm thinking this. I was curious in terms of audiences, how the audiences uh, react to these uh, these uh, uh, very direct and very intimate uh, uh, point of views. You know, the the rabbit that eats the carrot in my breast is a kind of a an image that is, uh, <laughs> you know, that is incredibly direct and 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 uh, somehow uh, uh, physically uh, visceral, and um, and uh, obviously in this kind of setting, uh, I, I think that's why I was asking about the setting. The impact is different when we go into this, you know, and. Um, so I was curious what your experiences are and um, uh, um, either it feels like from what MK is saying that you have this very uh, strong exchange in your sort of in the world of comic writers or makers. Mm. Um, but I'm also thinking about the, the audiences that are um, seeing that and that are sort of impacted more personally and what your stories are about that and how they react to that. Uh, uh, and, and I really, uh, I find it is, it is very intimate because uh, um, uh, I think Priyanka, you said, you know, there's a taboo about body, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, in, in Indian colonial history, the, the images of, of a sort of a physical, sensual, sexual body are, have been eradicated. And here we are back into a world where the body becomes very open, uh, both as a, as a sexual feeling, hurting uh, being, and um, as also a, a puzzle for the caretaker, uh, for the two nurses of you. <laughs> I, um, 
Yeah, I can speak to, to I mean, I, two things sprang to my mind at listening to you. And one was, you know, when I did a performance of this exact show and um, there was a person in the audience who um, had Parkinson's <laughs> that, and, and, and I knew that. And um, it, um, it made, it, it um, forced a, a level of scrutiny um, onto that part of the narrative of the of the of the show that I hadn't um, I hadn't experienced before and it really made me um, you know it made me it, it gave me pause and and made me just very carefully think about each word I was saying as I was describing this this patient with Parkinson's and what um their story was and what happened to them and um uh and then um my other experience was performing this show for a group of nurses and um and that was another that sort of brought another um another aspect of um I think, you know, I would describe it as like communion mm. Mm. <laughs> um, that that was new to me in in this in that particular performance. So um, I would say, yeah, those things very much, very much impact both for me, my feeling about the show and about performing it and also my own scrutiny of, of what it is I'm performing and saying and, and bringing to the world. So. <clears throat> um, there's uh, a hand raised. Um, oh, sorry. Did anyone else want to address Ula's question, Pinka? I don't know. I don't want to rush on. Yeah, me, Domingos. Oh, Domingos, yes. Yeah. Um, um, thank you for wonderful presentation uh, it's for me was uh, really um, uh, creative and innovative um, uh, when uh, <coughs> I listen to the presentation I'm thinking about the possibilities to establish relationship between uh, graph medicine and uh, the context where the level of literacy is very, very low. Uh, in fact, I don't have um, comments, but I have question. Um, I want to understand if it is a possibilities to establish the relationship between the context where the literacy level is low and uh, graph medicine. Um, let's give um, example and uh, detail to understand what I want to, to, to say. In some contexts, um, doctors realize that patients and the family members surround the patient uh, even don't understand the prescription. And they decide to draw how um, the uh, medicines um, have to be uh, used, have to be administrated. Um, my question is, uh, in this context, we can call this practice of medicals and uh, all stuff around them as graph medicine too? Um, that's a wonderful, uh, wonderful um, bridge that you're building there. Um, absolutely. I know there is a... Um, there is a, a, a scholar of, of art in the UK who's actually studying the incidental drawings that doctors and uh, providers and surgeons and make to help you know, people understand the procedure they're gonna have or yeah, the, the care that they're gonna get. Um, because yeah, we, we need to have that made visual for us often to understand. I mean, even when I herniated a disc, I thought I understood it, but I didn't and I needed someone to draw that for me. And, and yeah, that it helps us so much. Um, 
as far as in terms of the literacy, I think that, yeah, that, that, you know, I talk a lot about comics as an educational intervention with patients for all those reasons. Um, and, you know, we often send our patients out with, um, you know, discharge instructions from the hospital that they're never going to read or, or, you know, when you go to pick up a prescription, perhaps, yeah, you're going to get all this paperwork you're not going to read. And, or if you go to get a surgery, you're asked to sign a consent form that most people don't read. And we've talked in their studies going in all of those areas of if we did that in simple combinations of text and image uh, in sequentially, and even so much as a consent for surgery can be done in a way that people are going to engage with it. Um, and yeah, and to the literacy level uh, that they're at. And so that um, we know that we have informed consent, right? Um, or we know that they understand um, the way that a medication is meant to be taken rather than, you know, us labeling them non-compliant or whatever. We actually do have understanding and comics can be a great tool um, in that regard. Yeah. So those projects are ongoing and, and, um, and again, we like to be research-based. We're very enthusiastic about comics and healthcare, but healthcare is research-based. So there's, there's a lot of research projects you could look up um, in this arena to kind of get some best practices and different arenas where it's been tried and if it's been successful, you know, hopefully. I, I, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just have to agree and say that, you know, even without, that there's so many concrete uh, practical uh, examples of, of how images are needed mm -hmm. instead of language in, in practice. Um, with COVID, you know, in, in our ICU, uh, we've been having all COVID patients all the time for months now. And, you know, with COVID, it, you have to encourage the patient to lie on their stomach. And that's a thing that many people find super uncomfortable to do and resist doing. And um, these, you know, it's not even a question of literacy there. Um, people could read and you could offer them reading material that would explain why they should lie on their stomachs. And you could use words and explain why it's important for you to lie on your stomach. But I found that the single most useful thing to do was to use the, in our hospital, we have these whiteboards on the wall, was to use the whiteboard and draw a big mm. picture of the human body lying on its back and where the lungs are and how the lungs are compressed by all of the abdomen that's on top of them. And then the human body lying on its stomach. Mm. And then you see, oh yeah, the lungs are on top and now they can freely expand. And draw, making that drawing saved so much time of trying to explain and cajole and persuade. Um, it was an incredibly important tool in, in helping COVID patients do what they needed to do. So it, it seems to me there's a, there are two things. There's an, um, sometimes maybe instrumental use of images to uh, cut through, to explain, to clearly demonstrate what's happening with the body, which is sort of the most personal thing and the most close thing to us and also super foreign and un not understood by so many of us, which is what I think some of your stories um, point out. And then um, this is a little bit parallel, but the um, I'm not sure what the word is, recuperation maybe of these forms that are, uh, Priyanka, you said it very clearly in, in the Indian context, are, are not considered serious. They're not considered art with a capital A, perhaps. They're popular arts. They're, um, they're, uh, they're arts that people can do, which is why we love them, uh, as self-trained creators, self-trained artists can pick up a, a box of cradle crayons, as MK mentioned, and, and start or be uh, exposed to in a workshop um, without professional training, years without an MFA, let's say. Um, uh, so you're, you know, keeping these traditions alive and um, allowing them to speak as they're so good at doing, very directly to people, without um, the framing of a gallery or a museum or um, some other kind of art art frame. Um, and that's very inspiring. Um, so I want to thank you all very much. Um, there's a lot we can do. A, we have a couple of minutes as a last call out for anyone who would like to post a question or a comment in the chat. There are a few comments that are just um, 
people reaching out who would like to be in touch with you uh, directly. So we'll, we'll preserve those and pass on a few email addresses uh, to you. But any last words or last thoughts? It's so nice. Uh, you know, we've been thinking about the three of you meeting, and we have these precious couple hours. So uh, it's it's very exciting to to us here. But thank you for um, sort of battling the the distance of time and space, and 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 being here together. Um, quite beautiful. A last word from any of you? I, I would just like to say it's very exciting to meet both of you. And um, I hope we can get together again some way. As I curate this thing called Banners and Cranks, which is a, a festival of picture story performance. And um, it would just be really fun to, to talk more and to, uh, to, to try and make some events that we could all um, collaborate on. And, and uh, I think it'd be really fun. So thanks to, to you. I, I want to thank, um, of course, Anna and Doug here at Fourth Space for making the, these events uh, flow so smoothly and effortlessly. And um, I have to also uh, say a shout out to um, another professor here at Concordia, Ariella Friedman, who introduced me to MK's work. Uh, and um, uh, Ariella is directing a Health Humanities and the Arts working group out of CISC this year, and unfortunately had a, a slew of other uh, university meetings today. So isn't with us, but I trust we'll watch the video. And uh, so thanks to Ariella as well. Um, Anna. I was just I was just gonna say, Mark, oh. we'll send her the link. We'll send her the link so oh, she good. can rewatch this. Um, yeah, we just wanted to thank you all, uh, of course, uh, Claire for making the trip down and, and Mark for coming into Force Space and the few audience members who braved this kind of semi storm here today uh, to make it in. We really appreciate you being here. And Priyanka and MK, it was so great to, to meet you in this way and uh, become in contact with your work. So thank you very much for sharing it with us all. And yes, you can share the recording of um, this conversation and this performance. It's on our YouTube channel. We'll share it with everybody who registered for the event. We had quite a lot of interest. And unfortunately, I think the day got away from people here today for various reasons. So we'll make sure that they get a link to it. Okay. All right, folks, we're going to close up the Zoom. Thanks again. Have a great weekend and Friday afternoon. Thanks. See you next time. Bye. Okay.